Hello everyone, good afternoon. It's a beautiful Thursday and welcome to the Witty Writers Show and big welcome to my guest again, Mark Gottlieb from Trident Media Group. Hello, Mark. Hey, thank you for having me back. It's good to see you again. Good to be back. I, I want to say a huge, huge extra thank you for joining me today because before we came online, we were just talking about this huge weather system that's coming in affecting New York um, and, and well, um, my heart goes out to everyone who's been affected because it is awful. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's uh, people can't, couldn't get into the city today, even if they wanted to. And even for those who live within the city, I'm hearing from people who they say, can we come up there and get out of the city? So it's it's probably pretty bad there, too. And if there's any barometer of this actually today and publishers marketplace they do a deal announcement section they send it in the email to everyone in the newsletter and um only one deal was announced it happened to be for a client of mine a, a thriller deal i did oh, wow. um, I, I had never seen that before i mean not even a day where where no deal was announced uh but you know the fewest i've maybe ever seen was maybe amidst the, the holiday season you see maybe three or four deals announced but Today there was only only one deal announced, so no one could get into the office to, oh, yeah. I guess, to do this stuff. That's crazy, isn't it? I mean, I know all of us, are, I think, are a lot more adapt at working remotely now because obviously we, you know, a lot of us were forced to stay at home, you know, when the pandemic really took off. But I think it's very quick for everybody once you start going back into work, you get so back into the momentum so quickly. It's hard to go back to doing everything remotely and doing the quick switch. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, you're right. The silver lining in this was that people were kind of prepared for this in a way because they were enabled from before to to be able to work from home, to remote into their computers and things like that. So, you know, it was almost like it was another day with the exception of, of everything outside. I lucked out because I, I parked next to a storm drain. So I checked on the car in the morning and it was fine, but it could have been worse. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. And you, know, you just have to sort of, sort of thank your lucky stars for, for our own safety and try and help as many friends and neighbors and people we know as we can. Um, but I'm so glad you got to join us today, even with everything else that's going on in New York. I'm so grateful. And uh, just so everybody who's just joined us knows we are talking about what we should be doing while we're writing our first book or second book or third book. Um, now we've got lots of people joining us. So hello, everybody. Uh, please pop up your hellos and your questions. Um, and we will try and answer as many questions as we can. Um, you're more than welcome to invite all your writing friends and author friends as well. So they get to join in. Um, but Mark, being an author, especially when you first start, oh my gosh, it can be so daunting for us. Um, knowing where to start, what should we be doing? Should we just be concentrating on writing or should we, we be doing other things as well? From experience, um, I don't think it's ever too early for a writer to promote themselves as a writer and, a, and an author. Um, and a lot of new writers especially have to deal with the imposter syndrome because they don't feel like they they are an author yet. Even though they've already started writing their book, they don't feel like they can declare it and tell friends and family and, and, and hopefully do some prep work for when they are ready to start sharing their work. It's a difficult thing to to do isn't it i think for com confidence wise well yeah you uh you need to be kind of audacious and also uh always be writing you know when when you're done with one book it's sort of like time to start planning the next or time to start writing the next and thinking of ideas i know a lot of writers who they keep like a long list of running ideas so for instance uh, i have a client who he writes uh, world war ii historical fiction sometimes adjacent time periods and what he does is he keeps like a long kind of, you could call it like a menu list of, of items that he wants to have at the ready to show his publisher for when it's time to do the next book, just so he can continue to go back to that list. So 
even if it's just sort of like keeping a journal of ideas, um, but keeping keeping all those like kind of creative juices flowing, even between books and, and whatever else you might be doing, I think it's always good to be writing. And then, uh, like you say, you know, it's sort of like, I think you, you don't really, I don't think anyone ever really decides like, okay, I'm going to be a writer now, or I'm going to be an author. It's, they, they, it's like they wake up and they realize they were born to be a writer. Yeah. And so a big part of that is like you say, realizing that identity and telling other people, you know, that's who I am. That's what I do. Like, for instance, I have a client who, and he had been saying this for a long time, even before he got his first novel published, you know, in his day job, he's a technology attorney. He owns his own law practice. He's been working in law for a long time. But when people would say to him, what do you do for a living? That was not, never the first thing he said he did. Like he would always say, I'm a writer, I'm an author. And if it came up, you know, what he, he did to kind of help make ends meet, then yeah, it was that he, he did the technology law practice, but um, he shared his real passion and who he felt he was and what he did. It's kind of like, there's this comic strip that um, Daniel Klaus made from the uh, graphic novel Wilson. They made it into a movie recently with Woody Harrelson. And basically, uh, the character of Wilson sitting in an airport, he says to, you know, stranger basically who's waiting at the gate for a flight, like, what do you do? And so the guy proceeds to tell him, like, oh, you know, I'm a businessman, I do this and that. And he says, no, no, no. What do you do? Like, who are you at your core? And what makes you tick? You know, what makes you happy? And the guy just can't, couldn't get it. He was like, well, this is what I do for work. And so that's my identity. But it's not really your identity, right? Like, for instance, one day we all inevitably, unless we die in the saddle for whatever reason, you know, will retire from our jobs. You know, what happens after that? Do you see then just cease to exist? Exactly. You're not that person anymore? Like, you know, who are you at your core? And so if you're a writer, you know, that's what you should be telling your friends and family, regardless of whether or not you're published. Like, it's who you are. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more. I honestly couldn't. And I think myself, like most creative people, we just can't help but to create. Um, you know, and you're right. A lot of us do wear many, many hats. And most people, unfortunately, end up in jobs that they don't really want to be doing. They yeah. might rather be you know, full-time writer, full-time author, yeah. you know, poet or whatever. And oh, then yeah. they're stuck in that situation where, you know, you've got to get to a certain point before you can give up your day job to do what you love. Yes, yes. But I think a, a big part of it is sort of, I think you know this too, and what sort of what you're hinting at is like um, even even the, the best example or the easiest example may be, you know, an actor who makes ends meet as a waiter and they often choose that profession because they can easily shift their schedule around and get to an audition. And if people ask them, you know, what do you do? They wouldn't really say they're a waiter. They would say they're an actor. Yeah. And a big part of that is this, it's kind of like the self actualization I don't want to say self-realization. You know you're a writer. It's by telling people that and by living that, you you make it a, a reality. Yeah. Um, so I, it's like I always said to people, like, why does a green light mean go? Why does a red light mean stop? It's because we all, as a society, collectively agreed on that. Green means go, red means stop. The same way that money is just paper, you know, or it's just an idea, but we we agree upon it. Yes. And so it's sort of the same thing. If you, I mean, whether or not people agree with you, but it's that same idea. If you decide for yourself, that light's not, green doesn't mean go, it means stop. Well, first of all, you might get in a car accident, but, say, 
But when it gets. <laughs> yeah, or other people might get hurt. But so I'm not saying to do that. I do not condone that. But what I'm saying is, is it's um, what you decide and what you know in your heart. And then kind of the rest begins to flow from that. So it's a good thing you at the green light say go and at the red light say stop. You know, that kind of self-realization or self-actualization is important for your safety and everyone else's. But I think um, believing it in your heart, it's important. Yeah. I, I absolutely agree. I, I think too too many of us have or let our self doubt take over. And sometimes and you're right, until you actually put, you know, Beth Wesdale author or Joe Smith author, you know, you've got to make it a reality. But and also, especially if you're doing it later in life, like myself, you know, you want people to take you seriously. And the moment you start actively putting on your profiles everywhere that you are an author and writer, people's view of you changes. Yes. I mean, and I, there's a lot of people who think, you know, oh my, she couldn't write a book. She couldn't do this or he couldn't do that. It's nice to prove people wrong. Well, yeah, not just to prove people wrong, but to have the audacity to say it. Like a lot of people, you know, they go into safe professions. They just want to keep their heads down and, so sad. They never really, they never really do the Walter Mitty thing, right? He, yeah. uh, you know, has this wake up moment and then becomes this incredible human being. And the point is that any of us can do that if we just up and decide to. And the sad thing is that many people don't. I and mean, you just don't want it written on your headstone like, oh, he never got around to writing that novel, you know? Um, so, yeah, I think it's important to do that. And that's kind of ballsy and people will, you know, have respect for that. And then what you're also doing in the process is sort of like you say, you know, and I know you have so much experience in this area in marketing and publicity, like you're laying the foundations, you're laying a lot of groundwork, you're building an audience, you're at the very least showing a publisher, like, you know, there's a platform taking shape here. You're not just showing a novel and then saying that you don't really exist on the internet, like at least you have some kind of social media profile that, you know, alludes to the fact that you're a writer or, you know, author website is great to have anyway. Um, so, yeah, I think I think that is important. I, I've, I'm a great believer and I, and I believe in this across the board. It's better to regret something you've tried than something you haven't. Oh, sure. there is there is nothing worse than going through the rest of your life going oh what if what if i'd have done that what if i'd have tried you know what yeah, i always felt better asking the pretty girl to the school dance even if she said no than sitting there and wondering what she may or may not have said exactly and and you know something it it builds your confidence after a while yeah and also it de desensitizes us the more we do something the less it feels a big thing. So the more people we tell that we are a writer and an author. The, the less painful it becomes over time, right? Yes, and the less of an imposter we feel, especially as we're progressing with our books and everything. You know, as, it, as we're getting to the middle of our story or the end, we're feeling more, you know, justified in calling ourselves a writer and author. And just an FYI, everybody, um, it makes my job a lot easier because then I can invite you um, to these events because I can see that you're an author. Just an FYI. <laughs> yeah, it makes it so much easier for me, Mark, I've got to tell you. We have got tons of people coming on and we've got lots of people saying hello, so I'm just going to quickly pop them up. Uh, we've got CJ who says, sending prayers to all who are affected. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that, darling. Uh, we've also got my amazing niece, Finley. Hello, Finley, darling, who's got the voice of an angel and very talented, I've got to say maybe biased but she does she does um we've also got heather who's joined us she says hi beth and mark from Gemma and i hello and kisses to little Gemma. um and we've also got josephine in the uk and she's quite happy because we're doing it earlier time so she's not yeah. trying to pin her eyelids open to watch yes. <laughs> bless her uh cj says <coughs> excuse me Yes, I have 10 to 15 folders always. And when I finish, I check to see which one I have a feel for. 
good tip. Well, yeah, so, can't, let, can't let those good ideas go. You got to hold on to them. Exactly. She says, sometimes I pick one or another idea pops up. Always have that list. Brilliant. I have to say most of my brain brain explosions happen when I least expect it, either just as I'm about to fall asleep and I go, oh, oh that's a great idea. That's okay. when you need, yes, you need the notepad next to your bed when that happens. Well, I actually cheat because I'd rather not disturb my husband because my snoring does that enough as it is. I have to say, I am ai can't even deny it. So I do my notes on my phone. Oh. And I have my phone next to me and I quickly like either type it or blah, 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 and, and put it in my phone. And then that oh. way I can just go, and go back to sleep. <laughs> But there is nothing worse than having a great idea, not putting it down quick enough, and then waking up in the morning and go, I know I had a good idea last night. I can't quite remember uh, what it was. Oh, that's awful even, feeling. Even, even when I was younger, that would happen to me. Like in my in my 20s and my teens, if I had like an idea or something, and I, I would say to myself, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll remember it. You know, my memory is still good. Didn't always happen that way. <laughs> no, and I'm like Dory right now, honestly. I mean, I'm just about, I'm 50 this month. The big 5-0. Congratulations. Thank you. It's a miracle I'm still here. But um, yeah, I, I'm sure my brain is getting worse with age. Either that or I'm just trying to remember too much stuff. I need to write more stuff down, I think. <laughs> You've got a lot in there. I mean, your, your husband might think you're snoring, but you're actually composing ideas in your sleep. You're just, you know, talking them out, <laughs> thinking them out loud. <laughs> this is why you're my friend, Mark, because you come up with the best ideas ever. I'm going to remember that because he won't be able to watch right now. So I might have to uh, just slip that in occasionally and just uh, tell him that. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That is awesome. That is awesome. And um, we've also got Autumn who's just joined us. She says, hi, Mark. Thank you for helping all the writers out there. Glad I could catch the show today. I'm entering grades while listening. She's prolific, isn't she? Like she is the mm. ultimate multitasker. She mm. really is absolutely amazing. Um, we've got Valerie who's joined us. She says, thank you for this event. You mm. are so welcome. We're trying to help as many of you as we can. Um, CJ says, thank you for having this event, Beth. It is brightening my day so much. Oh, well, we aim to please, don't we, Mark? Mm, we mm. um, Autumn says, counting down until retirement when she can write all day and have the time to get all those stories out of her head. Oh, that'll be nice. Yeah. I mean, but don't wait either, you know, just start now and um, oh, trust you know, me. look forward to the day when you retire because like you say, you can write even more. You'll have even more time afforded to you. I don't know how she writes the amount of novels she already does. I mean, thick historical fiction, and they are amazing. I, she's a she's a powerhouse. She mm. really, really is. She's a, she's inspirational. Uh, Steve just joined us. He says, "Amazing session, Beth and Mark. Much appreciated. You, you are you are so welcome." Um, and CJ says, "We found a journal of my stepfather's where he was starting to write a book about his life. His dream was to write one. He never got to do it. He passed away from cancer and mm. didn't get to follow his dream. I'm following it for him now. Well, oh, that's yeah, you should pick up, pick up where he left off. Yeah. Do you know what? That is the biggest honour I think CJ can actually give him is, is doing it for him. I think that's absolutely amazing, CJ. Thank you very much for sharing that. That is lovely. Um, CJ says, Siri, while I'm driving, has saved me so many times. With my <laughs> <laughs> probably literally, it's probably not a good idea to be writing or reading while you're driving. So if you dictate uh, something, that's probably safer. Exactly. One press of a button and she'll do it for you. Although you have to be very careful with that because when I try and talk to Siri, um, because I'm English and I've got an American phone, she just says to me, well, that's not very nice. Yeah. I'm like, what? <laughs> she cannot get the grits with my accent, unfortunately. So predictive text always goes wrong mm. more often than not as well. So yeah, if you ever get a weird message off me and it doesn't make sense, it's because I've tried to use predictive text and Work. It does not work. It really doesn't. Um, we've also, oh, we've got Finding Chrisette web series, um, who says, hello, Mark, love hearing you two share. Oh, thank you very much. And um, CJ says, oh, my God, happy early birthday, Beth, birthday sisters, September babies. Well, thank you. And happy birthday to you too, my darling. 
Unfortunately, being a Virgo can be challenging at times because we're very self-critical and everything has to be perfect, which life is not perfect, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, Julie's joined us. She says, I've been asked, when did I first see myself as a writer? When people let me know that writing made them feel. Oh, do you know what? I think many people feel like they have a story to share um, and, and they want to actively write it down and, and really go for it. But it's, it's a case of taking themselves seriously. And I think we have to be very proactive when we first start writing our books, because not only do we need to tell people that we're a writer or an author, but we also need to start pre-planning and researching um, what we have to do as an author. We don't just have to research the type of book that we're going to write and the facts that need to go in it, but we also have to research being an author um, because there are so many things that you need to do to make sure that you prepare, shall we say, even before you, you, you finish your book. Um, beta readers, test readers, starting a, a following, all those things make a massive difference to authors. Um, and now, obviously, publishing companies are starting to pay attention as well, aren't they, Mark? They're, they're starting to, you know, not all of them, not all of them care, but if an author is has got a following has got people that support them, have got people that can guide them as to, you know, whether their book is good enough. All of that helps later on. Certainly, yeah. We talked about it in a previous show a little bit. It all counts toward what we in publishing call a platform, which basically amounts to is this person saying this from a soapbox or a Broadway stage. In the world of nonfiction, it, it's, it's kind of the be all end all of getting published. Less so important in fiction, but it's still, it's becoming ever more important, which is kind of concerning in a way, but I can understand publishers wanting to see there's at least something there to build upon. Uh, while you were talking though, I shared this article with you in the private chat, Beth, of um, a client of mine, Tina LeCount Meyer. She wrote this piece on my blog uh, called Growing Up with a Prophecy, uh, Destined to be a an author. And basically it's about how when she um, was a little girl and her parents had expatriated from California to Mexico, her mother told her, you know, she, she could see a quality in her daughter that she, I guess, liked to tell stories or things like that. And she said to her daughter, you know, one day you're going to be a writer. And her daughter thought it was the most ridiculous thing, you know, talk about imposter syndrome, you know, when you're, your parents see something in you. And I know like some kids want to subvert whatever their parents, you know, say or want them to do, but someone who, who knows you best and can see something in you and yet not believing it, you know? And um, she thought it was the strangest thing. And so years, she talks about it in the article. I don't know if you're, if there's a way to share it in the group chat, cause I had privately messaged it to you or if you search for the article title, um, Growing Up with a Prophecy Destined to be an Author, and it's on my blog, literaryagentmarkgottlieb.com. I think I can share it in the comments once we're done. Okay. So I will put it in the comments for everyone to see. So thank you for that. That is, that is awesome. Sure. Yeah. And you're, you're so right. There are so many people that have a talent for something. They love doing it, but they don't take it seriously. And uh, I think... That's very true of many writers and authors. And even now, I, th I think there are, uh, I'm sure in, you know, I mean, you know, people who have won awards, you know, that they're on the New York bestseller list. Oh, they still have some doubt about themselves. Even exactly. the, the highest echelons of publishing, like, I can't remember if you and I talked about this or not, but Ralph Ellison, after he wrote Invisible Man, which was his debut novel, and it won the National Book Award, you know, he delivered, I mean, you want to talk about the record player screeching to a halt. He de delivered this, you can see his speech online, the strangest speech about how he, basically he felt like he wasn't deserving of the award, oh. you know, it wasn't his best work. And then following the success of all that, it was as though he was staring at a blank, a blinking uh, cursor, you know, in the in Microsoft Word or something the rest of his life. Although back then, I think they were using typewriters. Um, 
So he was probably just staring at a blank page, but he didn't, he didn't know what to do next or how to meet that success. He wrote books later on, but he struggled with it. And when I asked his literary agent about it, Owen Laster, who actually my middle name comes from Owen, he, he mentored uh, you know, my dad who I work with. Um, uh, and I knew him all, all his life before he passed away. I asked him about Ralph Ellison. I said, was he ever working on another book? And supposedly he was working on another book. I think it was called Cadillac Flambe or something like that. And supposedly what happened was Ellison's house burnt down with the manuscript in it and it never got published. But he always, his agent always secretly suspected that Ellison burnt his own home down because he couldn't deal with, uh, you know, the stress, the, it's the self-actualization of, you know, you know, recreating the, the um, success of Invisible Man, which, you know, is like a classic nowadays. So I think for every author, like whether you experience success or not, you know, if you don't experience success, you're worried about it one day experiencing success. And if you experience success, you're worried about replicating that and maintaining that. And so um, this is something people, I think, feel at all kinds of, of levels. I think half of it is 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 competing against yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are our own worst enemies. We That's really, really are. And sometimes we just have to 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 get out of our own heads and 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 take a step back and think about things logically. Oh yeah. I mean, <coughs> just to share an interesting anecdote. I mean, I used to do this martial art called um, Iaido, which is it looks a lot like Tai Chi, where you know, you see people meditating in the park with like a dull sword. They're like doing sword meditation or whatever. It's a Japanese version of that. You practice this art of drawing the sword and making cuts, but you can't actually do that to someone in front of you. They would get hurt, right? Or you could get hurt. And so basically what you have to do is you have to imagine an opponent in front of you. And so I once said to the instructor, you would call them a sensei, like in the dojo setting, I said, who should I imagine in front of me? Like, what kind of person? Who are they? What, what's their size? How big are they? And he said, imagine yourself. And imagine yourself, but like you picture somewhat like the kind of your, your alter ego or your, you know, a Jekyll and Hyde thing. And a lot of the martial art also just concerned itself with, you know, Dis, dispel, uh, doing away with uh, the ego and um, you know because it's true we are our own worst enemies yeah we really are and I think you know if, when you first start writing a, a lot of us have that imposter syndrome that we have to get over and, and you know get past it and start actively promoting ourselves and doing what we need to do um, and then I found later on it was competing against myself with each book. So the book two wasn't so bad because I was still, you know, I wasn't, you know, not as many people knew about me. It was, you know, nothing, nothing was, the pressure wasn't too bad. However, when I got to book three, and especially because it was the end of a trilogy, I put so much pressure on myself. It was unbelievable because I'd heard of other authors doing a book series or a trilogy and then the last book not doing as well as the others and that's what they finished on do you know what I mean there was some I'm, obviously I'm not going to name names but there were some authors they had quite a big fan base and then they brought out the third book or the end book and their readers go this was this this was rubbish I, I, the others were much better than this and I thought you can't fixate on that because first of all, it's a, it's a negative wishing well. And second of all, um, you never know when something could take off. Like I was once talking to someone who was at the publishing house when Terry Pratchett, the, he was a comedic uh, fantasy author. He has a, that TV show um, with Neil Gaiman. He, he worked on a book with him. They made it into a show. I'm forgetting it now. Good but, moments. Yes, Good Omens. I love him. <laughs> I love what, Terry Pratchett had this very long running series called Discworld. And it wasn't until like, believe it or not, like this, maybe even the seventh book into that series when things really took off for him. Yeah. And until then, 
not only did he have to be continually believing in himself and his fans believing in him, but also um, the publishers were banking on him. They, they believed in him and his writing and that eventually it would, it would take off in a big and meaningful way. And uh, so you have to kind of have like a long view of this and not just see what's before the horizon or what's on the horizon, but you have to be able to imagine what could be on the other side of the horizon. I, I agree completely. And I, I kick myself now because it all worked out be way better than I expected. <laughs> so I think, I think, look back and I think, why on earth was I so worried? But I think, you know, no matter how many books you have out, there is always that little, oh, is it going to be as good as the last one? You know, as you said, you just never know. The only thing we can do as writers and authors is be true to ourselves, tell our story the best possible way we can, put as much effort into it as we can, get it as great as we can, and, and then just put the faith out there. Oh, you know what's a terrific example of this too that that I think your viewers might enjoy too is um, there's that recent uh, Quentin Tarantino movie, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And yes. a big part of the movie centers around uh, this character of Leonardo DiCaprio, who he's like this young actor. He's on top of the world one moment, and then he's starting to age, and this younger actor is sort of stealing the limelight from him. And he thinks he's going to, you know, not be able to pay the mortgage on his Hollywood Hills home and all this stuff. And then, sorry to spoil some of the movie, but there's a lot that happens in between and thereafter. But basically, suddenly he's back on top again by the toward the end of the movie, you know. And it's it's so true. It's not just the Hollywood story. It's the book publishing story, too. There's so many authors, so many writers who just one moment they might think it's up, it's down. But it could be up again, yeah. And it could be down again, but you—that's what it is. So you have to have to believe, and people have to be able to, you know, bet on success and things like that. Yeah, I I totally agree. And and sometimes it isn't always a bad thing that it happens after, you know, the third book or fourth book or whatever, because we've just seen recently, you know, an author called Ruby Dixon. All of a sudden, she was massively trending everywhere. Um, and, but her books have been out for for ages. So she must be literally dancing around our house like, woo -hoo! because obviously now she's got such a backlist. You know, people are going back right to the her first book and going one, two, three, four, and so on and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. and that's been the case for, for, for many authors. You know, they, they've not really had, you know, any type of um, viral success or organic success until all of a sudden, many years later, and then people start reading all their backlist. Well, it can really energize things. Oh, we, I think we did, if I recall correctly, we may have talked about this in another show, how that's sort of what happened for Dan Brown with The Da Vinci Code, because for that's a long time, funny. yeah, he was a mid-list author. He kept following his editor around, publishing the publishing house, and then it's like the water cooler effect happened for him, yeah. and he just rocketed to the top. And... Um, you know, there are other, there are definitely other stories, I think, like that. The only thing, you know, which is troubling to me is that, you know, there was a time in publishing where publishers were, were more so willing to, like the example we talked about with um, Terry Pratchett, willing to play the long game with an author, really look at it in terms of the writing. You know, the editors didn't listen to the salespeople at publishing houses, the bean counters as much. They were willing to follow a gut instinct and oddly enough it was a better time in publishing there are still some savvy you know risk-taking editors out there as risk averse as publishing has become but i will say that you're definitely seeing fewer you know five book deals now things like that more so one or two book deals if you're lucky and so what i always try and do with my clients is you know just sort of in hedging our bets you know when they're when they've delivered the last book on the contract or they're close to delivering the last book on the contract, or even if it's the second to last book on the contract, I always try and get them to re-up with the publisher if we can, just to at least get another book in under contract. Because um, I've seen instances where we've done that, where it's that up and down thing. You know, you can't always predict that every book will be a success, but 
if you look at the long game and treat it like a marathon and not a sprint, then, you know, you, you'll be much better off. And I think publishers who take that view with authors also, you know, are, are better off. Yeah, uh, definitely. And the thing is, things change in the market so much. And, and for, you know, what, what people need to realize that who, who are writing or, or do have books published, the market is so changeable and it's still a business. It is a business like anything else. Um, one of my great, one of my favorite analogies is, is, is sports analogies. Because, you know, when you think about a top football player, for example, you know, they've got all the faith, all the faith in the world, you know, they got nice big contract, you know, that everything looks great. But you don't know what the next match is going to be like, or the next match is going to be like, or the next match, or whether they're going to get injured or whatever. There are so many different variables. All we can do as writers and authors is, is plug on. Yeah. Um, the, the faith in ourselves and just keep doing what we love mm -hmm. keep that out there keep trying to you know get more reach build up our readership you know get that following because it helps with support when we, we do especially when we're doing promotions or anything like that you want you want people to follow you mm. and part of your journey so they can share that mm. those promotions and everything for you um and and just keep plugging away because yeah. you know one thing might not work, but something else might. <laughs> I mean, I can't tell you how many times a client had come my way. We tried to sell the first book. Sometimes it didn't work out, but we sold, if it wasn't the first, sometimes the second or third. And then once they were doing well, then the publisher and the readership were suddenly interested in everything else they had written. You know, yeah. that's what happened for Stephen King. He was publishing under the name of Richard Bachman for years. You know, the books didn't take off. And then when he started writing under the name of Stephen King and became the Stephen King we all know and love. The publisher went back, republished those books under the name Stephen King, not Richard Bachman, and now they're like beloved classics, you know? So, um, yeah, just got to keep at it. It's crazy, isn't it? Isn't it strange how things sometimes just work out? And, and you know, you just never know what's going to be catchy for people or what isn't. You know, yeah. one name change and... Oh, yeah, whether you want it to or not, life will, will always go on and it's always going to sweep you up in the tide and take you with it. And so you kind of have to go with that ebb and flow of things. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's it's crazy. It's crazy. We've got some more comments and, um, and uh, questions. Let's have a look. Um, if you do have a burning question for Mark, please put it in the comments. We would love to address it for you um let's have a look oh judy says you need a london based sir and beth we, do you know what we we're spreading ourselves all over the world right now mm -hmm. which is fabulous um let's have a look sean said my father told me i would be a writer after i won an essay contest in elementary school weirdly enough it stuck with me i'm finishing my first novel this month 30 years later congratulations there's never you know a better time like the present and whenever it happens it's great like i was talking to someone the other evening about you know she's an artist she makes uh, stained glass and she says you know i never got my work in a gallery i do this stuff professionally and i said you know look at someone like david hockney who i think he was like in his 70s or 80s when suddenly people started loving his paintings and now he's in like the MoMA and all these museums and he's iconic. Wow. It'll happen at any point in time. That's it. You just don't know. And you're never too young or old. Uh, you know, I've no, I, I, I've come into contact with child, child authors as well, which I think is amazing, especially when they've got so much support from their family. I think that's wonderful. Um, but you're never, you know, you're never too old or too young. And a lot of people, are in a situation where they have to wait until after they've retired before they can put all their time and effort into their writing. There I are do. many authors that have been successful in later life. I do understand that too. I mean, I have a client who I met at the Yale Writers Workshop. One of the first things she said to me when we met, she said, she walked in, I forget how old she said she was. She said, now don't hold this against me. I'm 78. I said, why would I ever hold that against you? It, that has nothing to do 
with anything at all. I said, all I'm concerned with is, you know, what's what's on the page. And we sold we sold her book in a debut and went since went back and sold another book to her publisher. And so, you know, good writing is good writing. It'll win the day no matter what. Do you know what, Mark? I have to say, some of the best stories I've ever heard have been from 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 older people. They tell the best stories ever, and sometimes you just don't expect it. I had a neighbour back in England called Joanne. She was the most amazing lady, and she was in her seventies or late seventies, early eighties. And I thought she was the funniest woman I've ever met. My honest to God. The things that she got up to in her youth, honestly, she would be telling me, and I'd feel myself blushing. I'd be like, "You did not, Joanne." She, oh yeah, I did. And I'm like, oh, "You should write a book on this." I, I honestly, if she'd have written a book, oh, it would have been so funny. So sometimes, you know, having the more experience and the more life experience, especially, can make your story even richer. You know? Oh my gosh! I mean. One of my favorite stories was in college. Um, I knew a lot of writers because I went to an art school, Emerson College in Boston. It had one of the best journalism programs in the country. Great creative writing program. A lot of great writers have come out of that school and taught at that school. And I had this friend who was like a young writer, and I always saw some promise in him. And I thought one day he could be a great writer. We always read the same books, and he had great taste in writing, and people admired his writing and creative writing class. And I said to him one day, I said, "Are you working on a novel?" He said, "I'm I'm too young to be able, to be able to do that. I haven't I haven't lived life enough. I haven't done enough, experience enough." And I said to him at the time we were we were at a, a concert, we were at a show, and so there was a big crowd of people in front of us, and so I just I nudged him and I said, "Here." Go, go live life. Go experience life. Go jump into that crowd. Go crowd surfing. Go into a mosh pit. Do whatever you have to do to experience life, and then you'll have something to write about. And exactly. he went. And he went. And he was like dancing in the crowd and listening to the music. But it, it wasn't just about that. Obviously, it was using that in every walk of life. Yeah, absolutely. I, do you know what? It's all about self confidence, and we have to be. More self-confident, I think, in general. We really, really do. Um, Heather, I think, has got a question. Oh, there we go. She says, once you have written a first draft of a novel or children's book, what are some tips for the editing process to make it to make most of it before querying agents or starting to write your next work? Well, I think definitely polish, polish, polish the manuscript as much as you can, you know. Don't just go over it yourself or read it out loud. Read it to other people. Share it with other people. And I mean, I don't really mean friends and family, although that's always welcome. But friends and family are going to be, you know, sensitive to the fact that they have a personal relationship with you. And so they won't want to, you know, hurt your feelings or anything. And so it's hard sometimes to get honest feedback. Uh, that way so like a lot of people go out and they join writing groups and they get beta readers and they workshop their stuff so basically you know take the manuscript as far as you can before you know querying it and in the process you know everything else you can do like if you're building connections in a community of of writers and people around you like i mean we talked about obviously you know building some kind of semblance of a platform, whether it be an author website or social media pages, et cetera. But if you're attending workshops and you're going to conferences and you're meeting people and you're networking, then try and get early endorsements for your book or at least the promise of it, you know. Um, any other kinds of bells and whistles you can pick up along the way, you know, if even if that's getting shorter works published in literary magazines and journals, you know, for the world of children's books, I think it's it's a lot different. It, it also depends on what kind of children's book we're talking about, whether it's picture book or middle grade or young adult. The best, um, in my opinion, uh, organization for that is SCBWI. They're like huge. They're like, you know, the, the Thriller Writers of America or they're like, you know, the uh, Romance Writers of America, but specific to children's books, stands for Society, Children's book writers and illustrators write, and they have branches all over the country and all over the world. So chances are there's one in 
your hometown and with everything being online, you have great access to it and they will be immensely uh, helpful. And then there's some really well-known, I think, workshops probably for children's books too. I think there's one called Highlights or Highlighters and there's another one I think called Red Barn or something like that. Um, yeah, so, you know, there's, and for every kind of book, there is something like that. There's like a community waiting, like, you know, to embrace you. Absolutely. And and just on Facebook alone, you know, there are plenty of critique, uh, critique groups, um, communities that will basically help you and, and give you feedback as well. So there is definitely a lot of support out there. The other children's side. The other two things that I think are really important too is, um, you know, writers, um, you can't just write and exist in a vacuum. So you need to actually go out there and see what's working well in the marketplace. So you should really also look at this. All of this really goes for everyone, but look at the bestsellers lists, you know, see what's connecting there. Look at the sales catalogs of publishers. You know, they feature titles on their websites. You can see the kinds of stuff that's working well in the marketplace. So, you know, you know, that you, your, your book will reach the right audience or you're, you're writing the, the correct kind of thing, you know, that you're not really out of tune with the rest of what's going on in the world. And then the other big thing is, I think this goes even more. So for, uh, children's books is um, you got to be reading all the time because it gives you, it gives you a feel for this stuff. Like one of the best examples I heard is one of my favorite writers, Hunter S. Thompson. He, and he wrote on a typewriter because it was, that was what people did back then. But what he would do was he would, he would take a book by a writer he admired who he wanted to learn to write like them. And so he would take Herman Melville's Moby Dick, and he would open the pages next to the typewriter and he would write each word. And what he was doing in the process was he was walking in Melville's footsteps and he was learning the feel for that. I'm not necessarily saying you have to do that, but at least be reading this other stuff so you know <laughs> what works well. Because for children's books anyway, those writers, the best children's book writers, in my opinion, are either teachers or parents or librarians because they're directly in tune with that audience you know we forget our inner child and what it was like to be that age and so it's hard to write to that age group unless you're one of those things i just mentioned or or really reading widely uh in that area oh, i agree i think research is so important at every single stage that the moment you decide you're going to write a book, research is your friend. It really, really, I can't stress it enough. And I keep saying it in the, in the Write Better, um, Author Smarter group, you know, researching what type of, you know, genre you're going to be doing, you know, what sort of age group you're going to be doing, what sort of, you know, whether you're going to be trying to write for a male or female audience or, you know, a gender neutral audience. At every stage, research is your friend. It does help you dramatically because once you know what you have to do and what is the norm or what is expected, you know which direction you need to go in. Certainly. I mean, uh, there are many times I've seen writers, I hate to say this, but almost almost like shoot themselves in the foot. I for, I'm very forgiving. I always see the potential in something. And there are instances where I've worked with someone despite this fact, but you know, if there's a, you might not know, like there's a particular genre or, or type of book that's not doing well at the moment. And if you're querying, you know, agents and, and going out there in the world and referring to your book as, I mean, I'll, I'll give a good example. I mean, like maybe if you're saying, okay, my book is a cozy mystery, you know, the cozy mysteries were for a while, they were very big. But at the moment, it, it sort of cooled off. It could change, you know. Horror, for instance, they're saying is making a comeback. Other genres, rom-com has been making a big comeback. Um, but if you're going around the, the world and saying, my book is this, and that's not what's in vogue at the moment, you know, it won't help you necessarily. So if you don't know, if you haven't done the research, like you say, 
um, I think for writers, like they need to um, just at least generalize things like maybe better than saying my book is a cozy mystery, just give it a blanket term, like say, oh, it's a mystery crime novel or it's a thriller and leave it at that. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I, I, I tell you, it's, it's worth investigating what's around you. As Mark said, what's trending? What what do you what do you see? What do you see coming up on your feeds? What authors do you see coming up on your feeds? You know, now there's so so many algorithms that are connected with what we do and our interests. Nine times out of ten, things like that pop up. I've, I, I constantly get adverts and things coming up for you know science fiction and fantasy and, and things like that and I can actually well everyone can see whether a post has had lots of engagement lots of shares lots of comments I pay attention to stuff like that if I see something that's super funny um, or super you know engaging I look at how many likes and shares it's had because then I know, oh, something like that does well. Okay, mm. I could do something similar and 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 try to emulate that. Mm. You know, not copy it, but emulate it because mm -hmm. you can physically see it work. So there is a, there's a lot of little tricks and things that you can do to help yourself. I must admit, um, we have got so many comments, so I'm going to quickly pop them up because we've got lots of uh, questions here as well. Um, Okay, James says, it seems like a series is a big thing now. Is it just a trend or here to stay? Ooh. I, I think that you it's a little bit of a mixed bag because, like I said, how publishers are so risk-averse now, more and more what I'm seeing, especially from newer authors, is publishers really want to take on what's called standalone titles, which basically means you know, the book works on its own. It's smart for writers, I think, to write those, but also to leave them open-ended enough that they could be built into a series if they're a success. So where you do see series nowadays, I think chances are in more, more cases that um, they were kind of probably built out of what was intended to be a standalone because the publisher wanted to replicate that success with the author. Um, it's not to say that there aren't publishers that won't commit to a series, but I don't see very many publishers today uh, over committing to a series, like saying, oh, we want all five books. No, chances are maybe they buy one or two or three, if you're lucky. And I think authors who kind of, it's like that goes back to that running list of ideas. Like if you have a bunch of ideas for different standalone titles, and then one of them is a success and you can, you know, you can continue it or write a prequel or write another book that has recurring characters. You know, I see a lot of stuff like that going on. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I, it, 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 as you said, it, it all varies, doesn't it? I mean, Becky Chambers, she's doing well at the moment and her series has done very, very well. But as you said, there is no guarantee. You never know what the readers are going to like. Oh, and I mean, her story was interesting. I, she was discovered on Kickstarter by her editor, David Pomerico, who used to uh, run uh, 47 North, uh, Amazon Publishing's uh, science fiction and fantasy imprint. And then he started HarperCollins. I guess he was perusing the publishing projects on uh, Kickstarter. Oddly enough, I do the same from time to time. I, I wrote to Becky at that point in time, she had already gotten picked up and was like content, I guess, with how things were going. Um, so yeah, and they did build that into a series, but that was a direct result of the fact that the publisher bought her first book, I think it's called A Long Way to a Small Angry Planet or something yes. like that. And that book, I think it won uh, like the Nebula Award, which is like the most prestigious award you can win for a science fiction and fantasy novel and kind of everything kind of flowed from that. So that's why I think I've seen them go back and publish more books like out of that kind of series. Yeah. Oh, her reviews are amazing. Very, very talented lady, very talented. Um, Cindy says, love this, thank you. You are so welcome. Um, 
Sarah says, hi, Beth. Hi, Mark. Thank you for hi. joining us. Bless her. Um, and Cindy says, what type of social media should we be creating? A writer's page, blog? That's a very good question, isn't it? Because I think from, from my experience and with the clients that I work with, <coughs> excuse me, I keep sneezing. I forgot to take my allergy med. I don't know whether you agree with this or not, Mark, but I think the, the best thing for authors is whatever they are the most comfortable using. Yeah, but that's really is what it boils down to. I mean, if it's inorganic, then that will really come across. Like if you don't know how Twitter works, then don't do it. Or if you try it and it's not feeling right and it's, or it's not connecting in the right way, don't do it. Um, in a perfect world, obviously you'd be on every kind of website and social media platform they'd all be connecting in a big way and doing well um usually in those instances it's either people who are extremely attuned to that stuff or sometimes they hire a company or, or a person to a social media manager or someone to do that stuff like a marketing company um but i think Certainly having a website at the very least, even if it's just something as simple as a landing page is better than nothing. The easiest thing you can do is look at the websites of other authors you admire and kind of take from that what you will. And then a lot of these website builders, like uh, personally, I'm a fan of Squarespace, but Wix and others, you know, they have author website templates that you can use. Um, but yeah, the, the social media stuff is... While it's important, you've got to be good at it and want to do it. And you're almost better off just putting your chips wherever things are really going to, to hit in a big way than spreading the chips too far and too wide. I, I think a lot of the, many of the most common mistakes that I see authors make is, is one, not declaring that they're an author. So they don't even have, a, you know, the word author on any of their pages. So how was anyone else going to know? <laughs> so I think that's super important. Two, having links so people can actually buy their books. So on an author page, actually have your Amazon link or, you know, um, a link tree link. So people with one click, somebody can click on there and find your links and find whatever pages you have. In my experience, most people, most of us are lazy. If it takes more than three or four clicks, well, we are not going to do it. We're not going to hunt your book down or hunt you down on Google. We want it quick and simple. So you need to have it on your author page or you need to have it on your personal page. So with one or two clicks, somebody can buy your book or find you and follow you to make it. So you've got to make it as easy as possible for everyone. Yeah, I agree. It's sort of like, um, it's sort of the opposite thing, I would say, of the grocery store. Like, uh, people always say, well, why do grocery stores put the refrigerators with the eggs and milk at the back? It's so that you have to walk through the store along the way. Like, maybe you're only intending to buy milks and eggs, but you see other things and you buy them along the way. In this case, it's eggs and the milk, you know, at the front. And then if people like that, then they're more likely to kind of click through the rest of the website. Yeah. Um, you'll always see that like in, in uh, digital marketing, internet marketing, like uh, they look at the click through rates and whenever you, the highest click through rate is always on the home page, and then usually a secondary page or two, but beyond that, the, the click rates start to thin out. So yeah. We, we are not patient people. The human race is not patient. <laughs> You know, and, and that's the thing. Do you know what I think as an author? I mean, obviously, you've got to learn. Oh, no, you're fine. You've got to learn, some, you know, some sales and marketing because we are promoting ourselves. Even when you've got a publisher backing you up, you know, you still have to do a certain amount of self-promotion. And the majority of it is psychology. It's understanding people. You know, that's that's the thing is understanding the way the majority of people work. Um, and once you realize that, you know, we all have traits. I won't if I'm if I want to find something, I won't go past five or six pages. I'm done. I'm like, yeah, OK, I'm done. I understand that about myself. So I make sure then when 
everything that I do to promote myself, I try and make it there, immediate, or at least within one or two clicks, because I know how I work. Hmm. So I think that's very important as, as authors, we need to remember that we are our own business as well. It goes, for, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, you know, we are a brand. We're not just promoting our books, we're pro promoting ourselves as well. And just one little last point, because obviously my background is sales. <clears throat> we can actually tell, when we're talking to somebody on the phone, we can actually tell whether they're smiling or whether they're happy mm. to hear from us. We, you know, they don't have to tell us. Our subconscious picks up those signals, those very subtle signals. And it's the same with when we're writing a letter. Mm -hmm. How many times have we written something or, 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 sorry, read something and you read between the lines? Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it, they could be saying one thing, but the way they're wording it comes across like they, you know, that there's something else going on there. Mm -hmm. That is very much the same with so social media. So if, we, if we're using a platform, as you said, like Twitter, and we might not be comfortable with it, whatever, Whatever we share and post on there is not going to come across positive. Whereas if we stick to the platforms we know well that we enjoy using, our enjoyment is going to come across as a positive feel to the people we're sharing it with. So I just wanted to put that out there as well. Is you have to you have to have a level of psychology, I'm afraid. You have to know people. Mm. 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 Very good way to put that. It's, it's all the little tips that help. It really, really is. Um, just the last couple of questions, because we are literally, we've come up to an hour. It's gone so quick. It's ridiculous. Oh, my gosh. Um, <laughs> no, it's crazy. Uh, Tori, she says, what's your favorite genre to represent if you had to pick one? <gasps> She's putting you on the spot. Uh, well, you know, I work across so many different kinds of books. It's really hard to say, but. You know, lately I've really been enjoying working with kind of upmarket thrillers, like that crossroads of where commercial fiction meets literary fiction. And, or basically you could think of it as like, you know, a plot driven novel that has a lot of character development to it. Um, I think it's like very hard to, as a writer, and, and thriller is like a very broad kind of genre. Like there are, believe me, there are, romantic thrillers there are science fiction and fantasy thrillers there's mystery crime thrillers it kind of runs the gamut even literary novels that are also thrillers like a lot of people consider cormac mccarthy and his novels to be literary thrillers um but i think it takes a certain kind of writer to be able to have both feet in the saddle and and to be able to do that it's a hard thing to pull off and i think that books like that are not only highly entertaining and commercially viable, but they have like, not just a thick sales tale, but a very also long one because people will continue to read those books throughout the ages. They'll, they'll hopefully go on to become classics. So. Yeah, uh, I agree. I agree. I Good answer. Okay. Like, uh, um, um, I don't want to really choose. <laughs> hard to. I mean, I love so much stuff. It's, but yeah. Oh, well, I love that. Now, Julie says writers who published their first books when they were 50 or older mm -hmm. Laura Ingalls Wilder, Bram Stoker, Anna Sewell, Raymond Chandler, Lorna Page, Richard Adams, and Karen Blixen, and Frank McCourt. There we oh, go. Great. Thank oh, you. Oh, I was going to screenshot that because oh, I, I love that. Um, let's see. Here we go. That's great. I want Look to say that. Savvy look. <laughs> that is awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that, Julie. You are awesome. Um, let's have a look. Julie says, um, oh, there we go. It took forever then. Finding a Facebook writers group has been a huge blessing. They really can be. Just be careful you check them out first because some are a little bit clicky and, and funny. So just, just be aware. Um, oh, my mum is there saying hello from the UK. Love you, mum. Thank you very much. Um, and Julie says, since COVID conferences have started going on Zoom, great blessing to be able to attend easily. That has been an absolute blessing for a lot of people, actually, because 
There have been so many people like myself who have got kids still in school or whatever. They can't go to a lot of these conferences and events. So being able to do them online has been fantastic. So I agree. Um, Marcy says, hi, Beth and Mark. She's been watching. And so has Donna. She says, hi, both. Um, Julie says, do either of you like to work with authors who write memoirs? Uh, well, that so that depends on, it goes back to the discussion we had about an author platform. So important to the world of nonfiction is, you know, publishers are wondering, does this person have a million social media followers? If they do, and a fraction of those people buy the book, we're in great shape. That's really key to memoir. They want to know not just is the writing good, but who is writing the book. So there was a time when it was a little easier in memoir. You know, even if it was a harrowing story, uh, yeah. it could still get it published, but now it's a lot harder. So you have to, as a memoir writer or nonfiction writer, begin to also think about concurrently with your writing how to build an author platform. And, and whether the topic is, is as you said, is there a, a market out there for that topic? <clears throat> I mean, things happen in the world that can spark, you know, a... a, a a more active search for authors who have been in that situation, who can give, you know, a voice to that. I mean, you take the Me Too movement. I mean, obviously the Me Too movement was, you know, all of a sudden up front and centre. So a lot more people were writing about their own experiences to do with that topic. So it does vary, doesn't it, on, on what is being shared in the media, etc. And also people like, so there are some people who are no-brainers for publishers, I mean, the moment Michelle Obama wanted to release her memoir, sure. I am sure people were clamoring. Oh, it was a massive, massive book deal for Penguin Random House. I mean, multi, multi million dollar deal. But you're right. I mean, for instance, when that book Unorthodox came out, and you know, that author sort of came out of left field for a lot of people, the same way Cheryl Stray did. I'm positive a lot of other publishers were scrambling to publish similar books and and there were other books that came out like um is it is it educated and uh, there are other you know even in the world of fiction that kind of drew upon this so there is there are trend lines you know that you can you can follow uh and i i even do in my professional life like this is going to sound odd but i saw that there were a lot of graphic novel style comic books being published uh, that were really cookbooks. And one of them hit the New York Times list, Robin Ha's uh, Cook Korean. Penguin Random House had published it through 10 Speed Press. And I realized there, there are gonna be more of these. And so I sold you know, a Thai one, I sold a Chinese one. Um, and you kind of run with it until the publishers aren't willing to buy those books anymore the same way that the adult coloring book craze kind of came and went so yeah exactly it's like as i said it's like any other business you want to get what people are gonna buy <laughs> it's, it's the same everywhere isn't it whether it's you know clothing business or or whatever you you've just got to realize it is a book business and if you do have a book or you're sitting on one that isn't trending at the moment and you've had no interest Keep hold of it because you never know what could happen in another two years, three years, or whatever. That topic or genre or or oh yeah might regenerate, and then you can you you've got it there. Then you can strike while the iron's hot and requery. Oh, for sure, that happens too. I've seen that a lot in the strangest of ways. Like um, some things are just nostalgic or throwbacky in a way, and and it all comes. It always all comes full circle. Yeah. Exactly. So keep the faith, everybody. Now, just before we go, because I think I've kept you long enough, you've been very patient, Mark. <laughs> okay. Before we go, um, as as most of you have seen, I've been doing a promotion. Um, so whereby, if you shared my recent book trailer, you got entered into a giveaway to win this beautiful silver necklace. I don't even see that. It's got planets and stars on. Um, so the winner was picked out randomly by my daughter, who's awesome. And the winner is Suzanne Minet. So congratulations, Suzanne. You have won yeah. a beautiful silver necklace. <laughs> woo woo! I love it. Mark, thank you so much for thank joining you. us. 
today. Um, and as you know, we've got the chairman, Robert Gottlieb, coming on on the 23rd of September, which is so exciting um, because obviously, I mean, I know you've learned so much from him. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, That's probably an understatement. Um, so we're super excited to have him coming on the show live, which is wonderful. If you want more details on that, you can actually look on Trident Media's face, Facebook page. Um, the event is on there as well, as well as my author page. So don't forget to invite your friends who are writing or who are authors, because we want to try and obviously give as many people as in, much information as we possibly can. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mark, for coming on again. Hopefully we might be able to do another one um, fairly soon, although I am moving right now. Hence the empty shelves behind me because I've been packing like a mad woman. Mm -hmm. But hopefully we will all see you again soon. So thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you so much, Mark. And we will see you all again soon for the Witty Writers Show. Take Bye care. Be well. Everyone.